Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is John Lee. I am a local real estate agent here in Philadelphia, greater Philadelphia area. I am here with a good friend of mine, Albert Wu, who is also a real estate investor, just like me. I thought we um, we switch it up. Normally, um, I have a set questions for my people who I interview, but today we're just going to keep it like uh, pretty light and free, pretty free flowing. So Albert, if you would like to to give uh, everyone uh, an introduction of who you are and what you do. Yeah, um, my name is Albert Wu. I buy and renovate properties for rentals in uh, West Philadelphia. Um, I mean, that's that's all I do actually. So, um, you know, that's that's just the the sum of it. Yeah. So West Philadelphia is your market. Um, I personally know that you're obviously from New York. Um, and you you came from New York and started to invest in Philadelphia. So what's uh, well now you live in Philly, but you came from New York. So what was the what was that? How how was that whole transition? How did that come along? Yeah, I mean, I, I came from New York, so um, cost of living was higher. Like pretty much going out was super expensive, and um, you know, someone was like, "Hey, I think it was Nick Tang." He actually said, "Hey, come to Philadelphia. I want to show you something." <laughs> and I was just like, "Wow, okay, this place is like." way cheaper than new york like sometimes the food was way better and right. i was just like w like there's a disconnect here like why 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 live in new york when i could be in philadelphia you know like i'm paying less you know obviously it just, the the main difference i noticed was that it was slightly dirtier than new york but aside from that like it was it was a pretty you know it was a pretty easy you know yeah you're on mute in the market okay there you go yeah, so your decision to choose Philadelphia obviously was a financial decision, right? Um, but why West Philly? Like, what made your eyes set on West Philly for investment purposes? Um, well, I didn't actually know too much about Philadelphia at the time. Um, I had someone who was a wholesaler, who's someone who finds you cheap properties, just reach out to me and say, hey, I got these properties out in uh, West Philadelphia. Um, why don't you come take a look at it with me? And um, the numbers were pretty good back then, you know, we would buy a house for like 30,000, you know, long abandoned. And um, then we would put like 20, 25,000 just to get it up and running again. And, you know, we were able to, you know, make decent rents like 900 bucks. And, you know, that made a lot of sense to me coming from New York where, you know, you have to spend at least 300,000 and, you know, you were only making maximum 3000 on rent. So I said, 900 bucks for 50,000 or like, you know, or three, 3,000 for 300,000. Right. And, and it's a pain in the butt to uh, do evictions in New York, whatever it is in Philadelphia is like, is, is like at least half or three times less than New York in terms of headaches. Oh, I didn't know that. Cause I had to deal with my fair share with evictions here in Philly. And I thought it was pain in the ass. So you're, you're telling me New York is even harder. Okay. Wow. All right. So, um, when you're assessing certain areas like a West Philly, like how do you like, like what what kind of criteria did you use to determine that West Philly was the area and the only area that you like to invest? It wasn't that it was the only area. It's just that when I started to think about it, um, if I focus on multiple areas, uh, it would take my, it would take me all across Philadelphia. And, um, you know, it would distract me from doing construction jobs and stuff like that. So if I had all my crews, all my people in one location, you know, theoretically, it should be a lot easier to manage and also, you know, get projects done. So, you know, I had an idea of like, hey, you know, if I'm going to buy, I should just buy in one central location right. instead of spreading myself all over Philadelphia. Right. I mean, you know, if I if my first market if that first wholesaler brought me to Germantown, I would be buying all in Germantown. <laughs> so, you know, it just became the luck of the draw that I ended up in, uh, in West Philadelphia. Yeah. It's so weird that you say that. Cause I, I personally started to get attracted to West Philly because I saw not obviously, de you know, development and, you know, construction. Um, but also just the numbers, like doing the burst strategy, right just made more sense for me. So that's why I decided to to go into West Philly. But my strategy is actually a lot different. Like I, I kind of just went in and I was like, oh, any house in Philadelphia, 
where the numbers made sense, I just ended up buying it. So um, I have a little bit of it everywhere. I have it in Germantown, Mount Airy, Alany, you know, Southwest Philly, West Philly. So um, you make a good point because I remember you distinctly saying with property management, by the way, I still remember this. Uh, you always want to find property managers that typically are managing uh, like in a central location because Philadelphia is so damn big, right? Mm -hmm. So why don't you want to, can you elaborate on that? Um, I think f f we're finding property managers. It also comes down to, do they know how to manage with the specific type of tenants that you're looking for? I think that's the biggest um, qualifier. Because, you know, like if you're, if you're managing like center city buildings and all of a sudden I say, hey, come manage these, you know, West Philly buildings, you might not understand the tenant class and the psychology and like how it works out in right. that specific area. And, you know, you would get, you know, less, um, you know, quality in terms of management. Um, I think that that's probably the biggest factor. And if, you know, your property managers doing a lot of like properties in like, working class neighborhoods and all of a sudden you give them a property in a you know location like center city then the opposite problem would happen too like they would have trouble like servicing you know those you know top end clients right so you know it's just it's just you know observing what people's strengths are and you know where uh where that can be focused mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think one thing that I was thinking of when you were talking with me once was uh, certain property managers are, are are being stretched like too thin, right? So imagine you having a property in Northeast Philadelphia, and then there's another property in South Philadelphia. Like, how can the property manager actually service two properties, you know, and you times that by, you know, 150, right? Like, depending upon how many units do they have, like, do they have that capacity and bandwidth to to service everything all throughout Philadelphia, as opposed to having, you know, managing areas like specific areas that they like or that they have experience in? Yeah, it depends on their team size. I mean, like we we found a property manager that had a small presence in West Philly, but we added to their um, list uh, substantially in this in this location. Right. Um, it makes it easier because when there's a service call to one property in that area, they can address the other service calls in the other spots as well. Um, my original idea was that I was going to go do the management myself. And so that's why it didn't make any sense for me to go, you know, make, send my people all over, all over the, uh, all over Philadelphia to get right. things done. And um, you know, if they were in West Philadelphia already, they could just jump to the next one, which was a, you know, a very close drive. And um, you know, that's how I, you know, decided, in terms of property management, that's what I was going to do. Cause in the beginning we were self-managing right? and self-managing, you only, you only got yourself and, you know, whoever you have on your team. And then, you know, we graduated to, you know, regular property managers and some of them weren't in the location. They were just trying to build up their, you know, unit count, but that doesn't work for me because they weren't providing the service and they didn't know the rules. So, you know, we ended up, you know, moving a couple of times. I think I, went through four property managers until I found, you know, the one that I'm using right now. Um, and they just seemed to, you know, work decently in the, you know, neighborhoods that I was in for the tenants that I was looking, um, the tenants that I was uh, servicing. So. Yeah. And even for me, like, I'm, I'm so thankful to have you in my life because uh, the same property managers that you're using, I'm using myself and I'm sure they've gotten a lot of business from you, right? Like from, from, from referrals and references. <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah dude um so one of the things that a lot of newer investors do uh especially for me when i first started was i went on bigger pockets a lot right i'm sure you're familiar with the with the with the forum and podcasts and all of that and they always talk about when you get into investment properties that you should always consider like the math right the math is what makes the investment either good or bad right um, so some of the things they consider, especially with like capital expenditures, um, repairs, maintenance, property management, right. Um, when you do the math, right. Um, like, like those things obviously need to be considered, right. But how do you, how do you determine what is a cash flowing, a good cash flowing property for you? Um, usually it depends on 
how I'm financing the properties because that that plays a big role. If it's financing cash, um, you know, I'm less I'm less worried about what the interest rates are, um, right. because it, it's all based on a payment. Um, and also, you know, I'm looking at like how much um spread do I have after I pay my mortgage payment, because the mortgage payment is pretty hefty. I think, you know a huge majority, like a majority of the rental income they do collect actually goes to pay off a mortgage. Right. And, you know, like if tenants don't pay, like in, during COVID, um, if you don't have adequate reserves, you could go bankrupt or you'd have to sell your entire portfolio um, pretty cheap just to get out of, you know, the obligations that you have. So, you know, those are kind of things to, you know, consider with the, with the rental properties. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, let's uh, discuss the elephant in the room then, bro. Like uh, with 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 interest rates rising, right? It's causing a lot of uh, eyebrows to raise, right? From both sellers and buyers. And uh, even for investors, right? It's becoming more and more difficult uh, to, uh, to, to find some deals. Um, so what's, what's your take on it? Uh, what's your plan? What's your goals here? Yeah, I mean, I, I look at it this way, right? There's there's like a deep like very strong buy there are very strong buyers out there like guys who have millions and millions and millions of dollars worth of cash and even though like payments are like all like properties are kind of like capped by interest rates and stuff like that there's always gonna be some kind of like um you know floor on the prices just because at some point you get such a huge return by investing straight cash that you know, whatever the interest rate is, it really doesn't even matter anymore. So, you know, at some point, like, even though interest rates keep going up, there's, a, there's like a, I think like a D like, um, it doesn't go proportionally with, with how much interest rates go up because, you know, the interest rates generate payments. Right. But at some point, you know, you're walking into, um, price wise, the pricing where like deep cash buyers come in, you know, very heavily, you know, um, people with very heavy, very deep pockets coming in just to buy stuff because, you know, nobody else can buy it, you know, or the payment's too high for everybody. So they're willing to buy it in cash and, you know, take a risk on a property. Um, so those people will start sw swinging back in the market and if, if not already, but, you know, they're just looking for huge discounts on their purchases. So, you know, if you're looking at interest rates, yeah, it does play a factor. But also keep in mind that like at some point the interest rates will, you know, some at some point the interest rates won't affect the pricing as much anymore after a certain point. Right. Right. And that and that's like what's gonna what's gonna determine prices, you think, besides besides interest rates. I mean, obviously the financing market, like if the availability of money re gets reduced by lenders and all this other stuff you know the the amount of buyers will drop and if the amount of buyers drop while people are trying to sell their properties trying to catch the tail end of the you know kind of like boom time right um you're gonna have like a you know kind of like a falling knife per se right you know like oh man like no one can sell the property and eventually you know some motivated seller will just take a lowball offer and then basically you know create a new comp that is super low and then everyone's like, oh, wait, where, where are the prices now? We don't even know. This one just sold for X amount of dollars. We walked through it and this is very close to ours. That means our property is worth this much. So then there's going to be like a new identity for like, you know, pricing in the market. And that's going to be discovered um, over the next couple of months. Yeah, I think in the next couple of months, I've noticed that um, there has been some price reductions, but also like housing prices definitely have to change so i actually recently uh saw a property with um with a client of mine we were we were looking in like like um you know nicer areas of philadelphia like um queen village for example and there was like <laughs> a home for like seven hundred and seventy five thousand dollars the mortgage payment i think was like over five thousand dollars and the gross rent was 4500 mm -hmm. i was like i was telling the listing agent i was like hey like although your comps support the current price like with where 
with where we are with rates, like it just doesn't make sense for investors to even buy, um, uh, um, you know, a property that doesn't even cash flow. So I, I even suggested to him like, Hey, like we're going to come in with a pretty low offer and, um, you know, see what your seller thinks. And surprisingly enough, like he didn't say no, you know, he didn't say like, Hey, you're being ridiculous. I think he was somewhat understanding of the situation of what the markets, you know, how the market's changing. So I think you make a good point there. Yeah. I mean, people, people who are a little bit more savvier, um, you know, are probably looking at like, Hey, you know, if I, if I could take a discount, like a slight discount to what I thought I wanted, or like, I know what's going on because I'm also buying on the other side, mm -hmm. you know, then, you know, they're probably a little bit more likely to start, you know, looking at potentially moving some of these things at the prices today. Right. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a hit or miss. I mean, like right now, you know, there's probably a percentage of sellers that are becoming more and more motivated. Some are just still holding their high ground right. um, because maybe they might be like into a project for too much money and they don't want to lose money. Right. But, you know, if you, if, if, if the market is dropping and, you know, you don't want to lose money, you, either you're going to, end up holding it through the next market cycle on a downturn all the way back up, which might take five to 10 years and you being stuck in there or you lose a property or, you know, whatever. But, you know, like a lot of people aren't thinking logically, they're thinking emotionally um, because like it's either their house, their home, they live there, the grandma lived there, they enjoyed the property while they were younger or like, you know, it's just like they got emotional with their investment. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's the, the market is, starting to flush itself out i think the um the smarter like investors that are very like um you know numbers oriented objective oriented like they're already starting they've already started cashing out some of their properties even in these last couple of months just because they realize they might not you know want to be holding as many assets and rather be in cash to finish other projects or you know you know redirect their money elsewhere so that's you know consideration right right so um, with all this being said, like, what's your current strategy? What are you looking at to do? You know, what are you looking to do, I should say? Um, building as many cash reserves as possible. I mean, like right now, there's a lot of uncertainty coming out of Pike. Um, if, you know, if things start getting wacky, if you get caught in a situation where, you know, tenants stop paying or, you know, whatever mishap starts to happen, you never put those reserves in the reserve pile you're going to end up getting, you know, everything taken back and you're going to have to start all over again after this market cycle is over. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some people have gone through that experience before in 2008 and that's not a pleasant experience from what I hear. So, you know, right now is the time to, you know, conserve cash. And, you know, if you find a, a deeply discounted property, it might be worth doing, but like projects that you, that are being bought today, like I'm looking at it, like it used, it takes me, you know, uh, it used to, it, I used to look at projects that used to take me like three to four months to complete because I need to pull permits and everything. Now I'm just looking for stuff that, you know, I can just put some paint, you know, um, fix it up lightly and just get in and get out because the amount of time, um, that your inner property should be going down right now. Cause like, you know, you, you're increasing your risk with more time. Right. So that's something that, you know, that has shifted in, in terms of strategy is just, easier properties but just faster in and out mm -hmm. okay so with where the market's going and obviously with interest rates right um like like it's still we're still in a cooling stage so like with where we are currently do you still think it's a seller's market buyer's market like what do you think we are in uh we're, we're in the middle right now right um Motivated buyers are still going to be motivated buyers and motivated sellers will be motivated sellers. Um, but in, 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 in all, I think, you know, sellers are now starting to catch up with expectations. Um, you know, lower offers are being considered, you know, things that have been sitting on a market are finally, you know, they're probably slowly moving right now. Mm -hmm. um, and there are price, there's like, there's like, is like a story of the rich and the poor, right? Like the super rich, like 2 million plus, those have cash buyers, which is crazy. Right. And then like on the, on the bottom end, you know, the market is still moving because people can still afford it. The part of the market that has gotten gutted is like the middle of the market, you know, like the guys who have 
you know, like a house that's like three to like 500K. Those are houses that are going to be sitting for a while because of the payment issue of, you know, potential out sales to um, retail clients. They're less likely to be able to afford those houses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not just that, like, like think of how pissed some of these buyers are when they go from 3% to, to 7% and their pre-approvals completely change, right? Um, some of them are now being priced out. So <clears throat> I think it does show that it does show that there's trends that it's leading more to a buyer's market. Um, or I'm sorry, yeah, well, to more buyer's market, but also it's like, well, we're kind of stuck in a in a weird position because like why would some sellers even want to sell? You know, they're going from a low rate to now, you know, if they want to buy a new house, right? They're they're gonna get stuck with a higher rate. So, um, you know, I think we're kind of all over the place here. Mm -hmm. So yeah, dude, um, other than that, like, what are your, like, like, obviously you did mention to me, like your overall perception of the market. You did mention to me, like what your plans are. Um, I mean, like, what are you hearing though? Like, what are you hearing from other people? <clears throat> I'm hearing all kinds of stuff. I mean, like, you know, people are like, oh, it's going to start normalizing again next year blah 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 i mean like you know you got to also f figure that like a lot of people have like biases based on like what industry they're in like mortgage <laughs> like hey you know mortgage rates are going to come back next year like don't worry about it the fed is going to start dropping rates and you know i think what's what's happened was that like you know costs went up so much you know the restaurant industry was just like oh crap you know like all the service industries and what now we're like we got to increase these prices now they've increased the prices and like you know, people have been accepting them, but slowly as as uh, discretionary income drops, all these other like um you know spending habits you know get tighter, um in this in this uh, tighter economy as layoffs come and all this other stuff, right. you're gonna start to see, um, basically uh that that huge blow up of inflation starts to just come down, uh mm -hmm. slowly. And if not, you know, the, depending on how, how fast these layoffs are, are coming, um, that's that's going to determine a lot of stuff because right. if you're thinking about rental real estate, you know, like, yeah, you know, like you're making money off, you know, by providing housing to your tenant. But if your tenant can't generate their own, you know, living, yeah, it's going to pay you. <laughs> right. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a very like, you know, interesting time just because of what's happening with the market. Because if, you know, Apple's not getting, you know, like free money to hire tons and tons of employees. They're letting them go because now it's becoming too expensive at 4%. You know, they were able to hire as many people as they wanted at zero at 4%. They had to fire, you know, a couple, you know, a couple thousand. And that goes for, you know, all these other tech companies, et cetera, which are highly reliant on like um, these high, in like, you know, these low interest rates to, you know, expand. Now the interest rates are going up, layoffs are happening. And eventually, when layoffs happen, it trickles down to the entire economy. It's only a matter of time where it starts, you know, uh, uh, impacting, um, you know, every city, not just, you know, the big ones. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, I think we're also in a weird phase because um, when you look at short term treasury bonds, um, like short, short term treasury bonds, they're they're higher than like long term, like 10 year bonds. And, um, you know, th typically that's a sign of uh, of a recession. Right. Um, but then when you look at the uh, the inverse of that, right, uh, you look at uh, unemployment rates, they are typically uh, low or they're reported to be low. And um, it's like weird because I know like COVID definitely changes some of those numbers for the better or worse, for whatever reason. Um, so there's some controversy even to those numbers, but like we're in a weird position because a lot of, uh, professional economists, like this is the first time where I feel like some people are saying, Hey, we're going to go through a recession. Some people say, Hey, it's just minor corrections that are happening. Some say that it's not going to happen at all. Um, from what you're reading and from what you're like understanding, at least from the real estate aspect, like, what do you think the economy is? now where you think it's going to end up being and how it's going to affect um other real estate investors well i mean i just feel like so basically just i'm not an economist or whatever it's just kind of like a <laughs> yeah. 
so obviously I'm an idiot in this and I'm just trying to make a, you know, supposition of like what I think it is. Yeah. Um, you know, when, when COVID happened, they blew up the economy with tons and tons of money that went into, into consumer pockets yeah. and, that, you know, pushed the need for goods, which pushed the need for, you know, people to work in these jobs, right. which pushed wages up, which, you know, practically like shot the whole economy in an upward trajectory. Right stimulating it right yeah right and now we're walking into a phase where you know it's going to be very difficult to in keep in keep up these like um you know bonus check programs etc and you know now there's going to be a, a contraction of the economy because it whatever happened when you put money in in in, in consumers pockets is going to reverse when you don't give them money again right so it's going to be very interesting, you know, like then slowly, you know, supply chains are going to start unwinding because demand is going to start, you know, decreasing. It's already happened. I mean, like it's already starting to happen, you know, during COVID people were buying TVs like crazy, you know, and then all of a sudden, you know, Target has too many TVs in their inventory and they're like, crap, we got to sell these things. So, um, you know, like major retailers are like, oh, we've overbought. Crap. So Black Friday is going to be like, you know, big discounts trying to get everything out the door right. and you know, they're starting to order less, which means that at some point, you know, they're going to order too little. And then all of a sudden we're going to have the reverse situation until it reaches like until it reaches some kind of like equilibrium. And that should probably take like, you know, two or three years is based on like what happened this time, because, you know, everyone's trying to project what's going to happen. But, you know, no one really has a crystal ball. But with data analytics, you can get pretty close. And you know, if you're looking at these big company like earning reports, they're kind of giving you like a hint of what's going on. Mm -hmm. So what what are, what are you seeing on these reports? Like what do you what do, what have you noticed? Well, I mean, it's over the last couple of months. Like inventory is up. Um, you know, you know, consumer demand is dropping. Um, I mean, less discretionary income being spent. So like all these factors factor into like, hey, if you don't go out as much your servers don't get paid as much because they're collecting tips mostly, right. you know, and, you know, if the, um, you know, owner is not making as much money, then they probably got to let a person or two go in their business. Right. And, you know, these small little adjustments are going to keep adding up until it becomes a problem. So, you know, like, you know, it's nice when we have artificial money, but then like, we don't actually know where things are. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's like a balancing act right now just to figure out like how to how to make things work um, without destroying the economy. Right. Right. Well, I mean, Albert, um, definitely appreciate the time. Um, probably just want to wrap it up here. I don't want to hold you too long, but uh, always thankful. Uh, you've always been a help to me, especially in my business and when I first started. And um, yeah, I mean, just for our listeners, where can our listeners uh, find you? I am on Instagram uh, at Mr. Underscore Albert Underscore Wu, W-U. And uh, I mean, I, I posting there from time to time of like different projects I'm doing. But uh, I mean, that's that's pretty much it. Okay. Well, I'll make sure I put your handle in here. And um, thanks for everything, Albert. And uh, I'll be talking to you later, bro. All right. Sounds good. Take All care, right, John. I'll talk to you.